We have already devoted several evenings to the discussion of the various basic septenaries which constitute the archetype or framework of universal procedure. And it is quite fitting that we should consider among these septenaries the great structure of man's religious conviction. Antiquity regarded religion rather differently from the modern world. <coughs> we recognize the gradual rise of powerful sectarian groups, and these have had a tendency to obscure man's concept of total faith or of complete religion. In each of the septenaries that we have traced, we have made special emphasis on the fact that these septenaries emerge from their own root or from the first major division in each of the classifications. Thus, for example, we pointed out that the development of races takes place within the first race. But the first race never vanishes or disappears from the earth, but is gradually, apparently, absorbed into the great racial strain and the great racial motion. And ultimately, at the end of the cycle of evolution, reemerges again in its own totality. So that the seven races are the growth of one race unfolding to experience the total unity of itself. Now, in the same way, religion begins as a total concept. It begins as one faith, one great order of belief. And what we call religions are not separate on institutions arising at various times and under various conditions. They are actually the unfoldment of the great religion archetype which is given to man as part of his own essential nature. Thus man's spiritual unfoldment is under the keeping of a law, of a pattern. And this pattern remains available to him, though perhaps obscured in some ages, throughout the total need span which exists from the beginning to the full revelation of his own nature. The purpose of religion is not to impose doctrine upon man, but to release truth through man. It is not the end of faith that men should actually come to accept one religion as finally superior to another, but to accept the fact that religion per se is the sum of all its parts, and that the great religious mystery which deals with the redemption and restoration of human consciousness is a total mystery. Obviously, this total mystery is not obvious to us because we are not total creatures. We are not yet in full possession of our own faculties, powers, and perceptions. Therefore, having a dimness in our own sight, we see as through a glass darkly. But ultimately, this great revelation of world faith, a revelation indistinguishable in its substance from world law and world truth, will have its perfect work and will unfold through the creatures which it has fashioned for the purpose of its own development. In ancient times, religious institutions were termed mysteries. The mystery system, as it was anciently practiced, 
has virtually disappeared from our world. There are vestiges of it in Asia and the Near East, but it is comparatively unknown to Western man. The mystery system stands for at least two major lines of thought. Those sacred institutions which were developed as state religions arising with a people and more or less directing that people's career, its culture, its morality, its ethics. These institutions were racial and national religions. Very often uh, these religions were limited even to a single area or community. Therefore, there were religions which flourished only in certain cities or towns where the entire population recognized a certain faith, a certain institution, which had been bestowed upon them at the beginning of their history and which had continued to guide and guard their destinies uh, through the long unfoldment of their peoples. Our early Amerindian religious beliefs fell under this heading. The tribes could not and did not develop sectarianism. They had perhaps several deities, but there was no sense that these deities were in conflict, nor did these deities give rise to separate religious institutions. They gave rise only to certain divisions within the total religious picture. We have very little knowledge of the religious state of man prior to the great periods of enlightenment which go back as far as the second millennium BC. Before that time our records are too insecure for dogmatizing, but we do know that two, three, four thousand years ago, and even somewhat longer, great religious institutions existed. But these institutions occupied the positions of leadership in the total field of the people. Thus, the mystery school was also the college. It was the seminary for the education of the priesthood. It was the hospital and the clinic. It combined within itself practically all of the essential functions of knowledge, and all knowledge was its province. These institutions accepted candidates, candidates usually selected for their personal ability and for the integrity of their character. These were variously tested, tried, and proven, and after a thorough examination, far more complete than anything we could pass today. Uh, these candidates were accepted into the sacred schools. And in these schools, uh, they were given uh, their share or their participation in the common knowledge of their people, the worship of their gods, and the arts and sciences cultivated by that race or group. Those who received such instruction and were duly graduated were themselves persons of extraordinary authority in their societies, regarded, venerated, applauded, and held as semi-divine persons. All of these fragments we know. Earlier than this, we have an inkling of the general concept. This concept goes back to the primitive, tribal, and brood family custom of initiating the adolescent into the tribe or into the social group to which he belonged. Citizenship was not conferred by birth but by initiation into the tribal rights. As these tribal rights became more complicated and the tribe gave place to the civilization, the culture, or the state, these rituals were further amplified until they became a symbolical means of attaining maturity 
the individual who passed these mysteries successfully was the true citizen. He was the one in power to represent his people, uh, to vote in the common meetings and elections of his tribe or people. He must have this knowledge, he must have this internal participation in the deeper values of the group, or else he was not regarded as eligible to sit in the council of mature persons and legislate the future of his group, of his nation or tribe. Now these physical uh, factors arose apparently instinctively in man. We do not know where they began or how, but we do know that from the beginning they were universally followed. The peoples in no physical contact with each other and of most remote origin held these ideas as common truth. Thus we must assume that these institutions, or at least the instincts which produced them, were part of man's own internal life. They were not imposed upon him, they emerged from him, meeting needs which he himself had come to recognize, and fulfilling uh, instincts which he himself naturally expressed in his conduct. Now wherever we have such a pattern unfolding, we know this pattern must have its root in some adequate cause. Nothing from nothing comes. And in this world, changes which occur, pressures which are exerted, bear witness to causes or to circumstances equal in intensity with themselves. Thus we have another possible meaning for the term mystery school. It represents an invisible order of religion. It represents the psychic, spiritual, psychological cause of the religious instinct. It is itself invisible like the soul of man, but like the soul it produces visible consequences. And this intangible, from which flow tangible and obvious results or effects, cannot be regarded as less than the effects which it produces. Thus the tremendous rise of religion in the objective life of man bears witness to the subjective religious fact as part of the universal pattern of, of existence and of universal law. In the ancient writings and the old teachings about these things, therefore, we see or learn that the religious instinct or the religious concept perhaps can be most easily traced through the unfoldment of human racial evolution or the, r the racial development and structure of things. In the ancient mystical writings of the Jewish people, we are told that Adam went to school before the fall. We are therefore from this symbolism to uh, observe that man prior to his descent into a material state, while still during the Polarian and Hyperborean epochs, still visibly and physically a species rather than a race, a group of beings suspended above the earth or functioning through sensitized fields of energy, as we previously have described, that these beings, though not aware and not objectively polarized on a material level, still retain their spiritual contact with the great invisible universe around them. In this spiritual state, in this condition of internalization, uh, they were under the instruction and direction of the hierarchs, or the great orders of beings, with whom they were still in kind of contact. And in the old writings we often learn or hear that in these ancient times man or the pre-Adamite creature had an internal sharing in the great creative process of the hierarchies. Now the hierarchies are the great orders of beings transcending man and administrating the world under the direction and power of the Loboi or the great gods. 
These hierarchies are therefore orders of beings between gods and men, orders whom the Greek call the heroes, the demigods, or the superhuman beings, the mysterious and wonderful teachers who walk the earth in the dawn of things. These hierarchs probably did not teach in the sense of human souls or beings sitting about and listening to them. The teachment was by way of man's internal contact with the entire order of creation. Thus man could observe the splendor of the spheres and realize that these were not merely globes floating in space or circling the sovereign altar of the sun, but that these were living beings, that these were indeed great angels, planetary or star spirits, and that this whole creation was full of life, full of radiant beings, serving, unfolding the various potencies and potentials which constitute the universe. Man having this internal vision could not be ignorant. He therefore could have no unreasonable doubts about providence. In fact, perhaps he could not even be aware of providence. He could not know good or evil. He could only adore that which was, or, to rec or recognize the sovereignty of things known. And about things known, there is no confusion. There is no question, no inconsistency, and no conflict. It is about things not known or not generally obvious that we have difference of opinion. Thus in this period, where it is said in the ancient Kabbalistic writings that human beings went to school in the University of the Angels, man lived in the presence of causal agencies, revered them, understood them, and accepted them. Therefore he lived in an experience of participation in a universe of life. He, he existed in a participation in the total conscious existence of space, as though indeed the heavens opened and the magnificent celestial choirs of Milton were known to him and experienced by him. When through what has been symbolically referred to as the fall of man, the human being descended into a state of obscuration in which his internal faculties were darkened and his knowledge of causes no longer gave him the vital facts of his own origin and destiny. He became, so to say, an orphan, a blinded creature, who as he lost sight of the roots and substances of universal existence, found in their place the unfolding objective universe of matter. By degrees, his sensitivities to the material environment increased. And as these increased, even the dreams and memories of ancient things were submerged, and he became the victim of his own eyes, of his own sensory perceptions, of his own cognitional faculties. And by slow stages, he oriented himself in a material world and saw around him many things, within him very little. Yet these things which he had known could not cease. His own internal sharing at the beginning of things and in the total inner of himself, his sharing of this vast universe of fact, this absolute reality, this did not die because nothing dies. Things are only obscured or seem to retire into the deep recesses and fastnesses of unconscious storehouses. But out of these roots, even primitive man had certain kinds of recollections. Recollections that were only available to him in dreams, in visions, and in his mystical trances and contemplations. He discovered, however, that if he became very quiet, if he became completely detached from the objective interests and concerns that were increasing around him and within him, he still could feel the strange impress of the great seal of universal reality. This is the seal that Bailey calls the signatarum rerum, the great signature of things. 
the great impression, the archetypal reality, was still somewhere within himself. But it only came out to him in symbols, in inf and in fragmentary visions, and in dreams, and in distorted pictures. But still this pressure was there. And it was this pressure which gradually forced man to, be, to create, to objectify with himself the symbolism of his internal conviction. Thus man, objectively, materially, began to build the structure of his faith. He built it from his own impulses, his own instincts, and his own needs. And there is no question in the world that Ingersoll was in part right when he said that an honest God is the noblest work of man. That man actually created his own gods. He created his own angels and devils. He created the numerous and various sectarianisms which have arisen in his world. But this is only part of the story. Just as primitive mankind first projected from itself the strange, distorted bodies which it was later to occupy, and only when these bodies, rising from the primary eros or slime of progenital matter, when these bodies reached a certain degree of growth, they were ensouled. And it is the same with the strange mystery of religion. When the symbols and the primitive rites and the crude worships of man gradually refined, gradually took upon themselves an integration of moral and ethical significance, these bodies became ensouled by the great descending order of hierarchs. Thus, in each case, a religion is born. It is born when a belief is ensouled, just as man is born when a body is ensouled. Thus, as man was building upward his dream, a dream which might not have been very different from the Tower of Babel, at the same time, from the invisible world, the great archetypal pattern was also flowing into manifestation. And the union of the archetype with an appropriate form represented an ensoulment or a coming into life. And at various stages down through the great descent of human experience, the primary and primitive religious instincts of man have gradually led to ensoulments in which through one mystery or another, uh, faiths have suddenly become vital, have suddenly ceased to be merely human accumulations, and have received into and upon themselves the stamp of a divine destiny. All faiths were not ensouled. Some were too imperfect and died in limbo. Others had but a brief and passing existence. But gradually out of the ruins of some and the struggles of others, have emerged the great instruments or vehicles in which the power of the hierarchies uh, ultimately came to be embodied, producing religious experience, religious differentiation, religious evolution, and ultimately to produce, as in the race, the final culmination of embodiment, which is the restoration of the absolute identity of life. Now <laughs> well, this problem is long and arduous and difficult, and it does not to serve our purposes particularly well to devote too much in time and attention to it. But I think we should realize that the human being, for example, does the same thing in his daily living. Perhaps on religious and philosophical matters he is a little dim. He is not quite sure how important these things are to him. He is exposed to beliefs constantly. He is nominally associated with beliefs. But in his growth, there is a time when all his believing, all his seeking, all his searching, all his scattered but valuable convictions are brought together and ensouled by one purpose. Suddenly, what he terms religion becomes a vital living force, binding together all of these elements and becoming a dynamic in his life. This shift from a static to a dynamic spiritual position is really the ensoulment of the religious conviction of the individual. Now, how and when does this occur? As in the universe, it is almost a perpetual process of occurrence. It occurs in many levels, 
according to the spiritual need of the individual. But on every level, there is the seeking and the finding, and there is finally orientation as the result of conviction becoming dynamic, taking a central place in the life and assuming leadership. Thus, wherever conviction becomes the leader, wherever faith achieves its victory over doubt, wherever the individual moves into some position in which spiritual values become leaders, become dynamics in his ca character and in his conduct, then he may be said to have brought a union between religion as a universal mystery and religious symbolism as a series of personal experiences. Obviously, as man evolves and produces more adequate instruments, these ensoulments become more vital, uh, more universal, more profound, more lasting, more secure, and certainly more comforting and inspiring. But on each level, man ensouls his general conviction with the level of dynamic available to him. Just as in listening to words, each of us bestows upon the word the meaning which is the total of our own knowledge at that particular time. And so we keep on bestowing. And this bestowing upon things of something of ourselves is part of the mystery of religion. And that is why individuals belonging to different religions may have, without realizing it, the same convictions. And why those belonging uh, to the same religion may have, without realizing it, different convictions. Because they can secure from it only that which they can bestow upon it from the resources coming into ex expression from within themselves. Thus, ensoulment is a motion of energy from within the individual which is forever taking over and becoming dominant uh, in, in the patterns which man creates. Now in the Eastern philosophies, there was the belief that at a very remote time, as soon as the great polar cap began to crystallize, in the very beginning of the Earth's solidification, the rotation of the Earth at the poles was less rapid than at the equator. And as a result of that, the crystallization began at the polar caps and moved slowly toward the equatorial band. As the first solid areas appeared, at the very beginning of the Hyperborean era, it is said that the polar cap became the imperishable island and from this imperishable island life moved to all other parts of the planet the reason being of course that the first area capable of sustaining life naturally became the first area to receive and disseminate life and as this life evolved it spread following the solidifying processes and moving as atmospheric conditions and the state of the earth made possible along the great lines leading downward from the polar caps. In this time also it is said that the gods or the great orders of Hyrox made their immediate connection with the earth and bestowed upon it the shadow of the great world mountain, Miru, the abode of the gods. The uh, old astronomers tell us that Miru was actually located in the subtle energy fields far above the surface of the earth, in the great northern polar axle point of the planet, far above all physical things and that essentially Miru, or the city of the gods, remains there, but that its shadow or projection finally descended into the newly prepared earth, and here at the polar cap, or in the imperishable island, all of the vast mechanism involved in the creation of a habitable world and the inhabitants of that world all flowed from this center. Thus, life began here, 
nations began here, continents began, and this one imperishable island also became the root and seat of man's spiritual empire. For it was here, according to the ancients, that the city of the gods was built, and here that the divine government took over. Now this divine government was not an autocracy as we know it. It was simply the great administrative structure of universal law. We think of religion today as something different from universal administration, but actually there is no essential difference. For it is the duty of the leader, whether spiritual or from the standpoint of intellectual or philosophical conduct, it is the duty of the leader to bring the law. The great teacher is the law revealer. And as man does not realize that this is a re-revelation, he thinks of the great leader as the law giver. The leader does not give the law, he is the channel or instrument for its restatement in some sphere of life or experience. In this great order of things, therefore, the Trans-Himalayan School, located on the ancient site of the polar cap, which because of many motions of the earth is no longer located directly beneath uh, the physical pole of the planet. This tremendous center of energy, this center for the releasing of the spiritual laws by which the lives of all things are governed, this center was set up as the primary religious focus of mankind. All religion known to man comes from there. All religion is an unfoldment or a revelation of the realities that are associated with this great center. Now the difference between perhaps a religion and a science lies principally in the, uh, the way in which knowledge <coughs> creates an impact upon the life of the person. The scientist knows the law. The philosopher understands the law. The religionist experiences the law. Therefore, religion must be grounded in the internal experience of realities. This internal experience means that the channel must be through the person, coming from his own internal and experienced and known by himself before it can flow from him into environmental ex manifestation for existence. Religion is therefore a living impact. It is not a contemplative approach. It is a participation in a certain valid spiritual experience. Thus religion has always taught, primarily as one of its great premises, this immediate experience of God, experience of the value and power of things. Now the Greeks in their mythologies, and the Egyptians and the Asiatics also, have shown us under fable and legend, under symbol and myth, the story of the divine power moving into objectivity. For reasons uh, that are absolutely valid uh, in the experience of man, these powers were personified, or individualized, or symbolized as beings. This does not necessarily mean that these powers were without being, but their being in substance was totally different from man's symbolical effort uh, to depict that being. Zeus in nature certainly did not resemble the statue by Phidias, nor could we say that the true Brahma is identical with the great stone face in the caves of Elephanta in the harbor of Bombay. These are representations, mnemonic symbols, asking to be understood, presenting the individual with a challenge, attempting to compel in him an attentiveness or a contemplation of principles through their appropriate or at least glorious forms. Thus we find in the Greek mythology that the Olympian gods upon their mountain became the rulers of the world. 
these twelve gods, again the twelve aces of Scandinavia, and in various parts of the world, similar figures, the world mountain, the new Jerusalem upon a mountain, uh, the uh, wonderful emblems and figures of the great mountain, and our natural religious inclination, as indicated in the Bible, where we are reminded that we lift up our eyes unto the hills from whence cometh our help. This raising of the consciousness toward the high place has some strange symbolic significance out of recollection or part remembrance, the symbolism of the great hierarchy, the great order of beings dwelling upon the mystical mountain in the center of the world, the crest and summit of which rises above the clouds and is invisible to mortals. This is the Olympian hill, this is the great triple halicon of Parnassus, where Apollo and his muses dwelt together. So in the ancient times, we are told that the gods, representing the divine powers, incarnate in their uh, most natural and in available forms, precipitated themselves out of their own states and became the guardians, leaders, and guides of humanity. And at that time also, the ancient records tell us that beings from other planets, elders, the patriarchs of other worlds, the lunar and solar deities, and many others, came and mingled with mankind and established within man, uh, within human society, the great patriarchal orders, which were later to become the shepherd guardians of infant humanity. These ancient orders being the orders of the psychopomps or the herders of souls, the shepherd kings of ancient religious writings. This school of the adepts must follow, therefore, the general laws governing all such mysteries in nature. Religion as fact consists of first a magnificent total fact, which becomes manifested as a septenary. And as the great blazing septenary of spiritual truth radiated gradually into manifestation, we see there truth or reality broken up into seven parts, which were known as the seven sacred arts, the seven sacred branches of learning. Now the truth of philosophy broke into the seven great branches of philosophy, which are still recognized. The truths of science broke into the seven sciences. The truths of architecture broke into the seven orders. The truths of sound broke into the mysterious scale with its octaves and its tones and its half tones. All these things were lawfully done because on every level and in every pattern the same great principles were asserting themselves. Thus religion is given to man as seven rays or seven powers of light. These seven powers being aimed at and being equal to the task which man's spiritual need reveals. Thus we have in the concept of religion seven cardinal virtues or the seven good things. And these are the remedies for the seven deadly sins, which are the seven things which are not good. It would follow also that religions would break into manifestation as great patterns in connection with and harmoniously with races. And it is also certain that with each root race, a root religious principle is introduced because at the beginning of each great cycle of evolution, it is necessary, as the Hindu tells us, for the deity Vishnu to take upon himself the embodiment and to descend into the ocean of time to rescue the Veda. That is, to restore the law which has been stolen away by ignorance, crystallization, and death. Thus, in each era, in each great epic, it is necessary for the law to be restored. And in this restoration, the great school moves into manifestation in an orderly and proper manner. And this manifestation we outwardly regard as the coming of a great teacher, 
but inwardly it is the coming of a reality through man, first through archetypal human beings, through advanced individuals, and later disseminated from, from and by them, becoming the common property of a collective group. Now another thing that we have to bear in, with, uh, bear in mind is that this great stream of religion has gone back probably as far as the first differentiation of the human being and therefore better than 35 million years and that our own or our own great Aryan faith goes back not less than a million years and that the great Atlantean religious pattern goes back from four to five million years. Now we cannot know or conceive of a religion that is that old. In the study of comparative religion, if you take it up theory, seriously, you will discover, however, that records, though not of this age, have been formulated by which we have attempted to distinguish the primary streams of religious descent. For example, one of the great streams is serpent worship. Now serpent worship has gone through innumerable vicissitudes, but serpent worship in some form, the faith of the Ophites, goes back to a very, very remote time. Another is fire worship, the worship of primordial fire. Another is worship of generation, the worship of the reproductive process in nature. These great roots go far back, and they perhaps come nearer to telling us how these religious concepts descend. Because today, underneath the surface of our religion, these great primaries continue to exist. But we have so overshadowed them with symbolism and with the uh, a larger intellectual approach that we no longer recognize that these great basic symbols still lie at the roots of our believing. But the point that we want to particularly make is this. We say there are dead religions, that the religion of Egypt is dead, that is the religion of classical Egypt, that the religion of Greece is dead, that many great faiths of long ago have vanished away. With these faiths have ceased the gods of Babylon and Chaldea. With these uh, faiths have also vanished the deities of the Near East that were worshipped prior to the coming of the Muslim faith. Everywhere it seems as though old religions have died. Yet actually no religion has died. Because every religion having borne its fruit, this fruit ripened and the seed was perfected and from the seed grew new faiths. But there is an unbroken descent of religion from the earliest experience that we know. And all the religions that we have today are the amplifications of those that are gone. Religions are not separate things, they are growths, they are evolutions, continually proceeding in nature. And any religion that we have today would have been deformed or would have perhaps even failed to exist had not some dead religion preceded it supplying it with certain elements of belief essential to the continuity of things. I remember discussing some of these points with the patriarch Athenagoras of the uh, Greek Orthodox Church. He is the ecumenical patriarch, the head of the entire Eastern Church. And he pointed out the tremendous amount of, the, of religious symbols that we had derived directly from Egypt how the great college of the cardinals comes from the 72 scarlet robed priests of the mysteries of Isis and Osiris, how the crozier, how the mitre, how the vestments, and how the rites, rituals, and sacraments all trace back to the great sacerdotal institutions of Egypt. Therefore, we are perpetuating today these things that we think are dead. For death means merely, in a term of psychological thought, a submerging. It is something that was upon the surface, sinking back, other things taking the foreground, and they in turn sinking back, until man gradually has within himself this vast storehouse of submerged values. And then under the various pressures of existence, these submerged values begin to move back again under the principle of law 
of uh, association or the conditioned reflex, these things are again available to man. Thus religions do not die. They simply live on in other faiths. And this is true, of course, of the particularly of the great Atlantean and Iron schools which are still strongly represented among us. We mentioned in connection with the uh, last evening's discussion uh, the seven laws of nature, that five laws are revealed to us and two are concealed. Therefore, that for two of the great laws of nature, we have symbolic substitutes, because these laws have not yet been perfected within our own natures. To a degree, this follows also in our religious pattern, because today we have many religions, but we have five great religious systems. These religious systems have descended to us to become living forces in our modern world. And these represent uh, the, the spiritual availability uh, which uh, maintains and sustains the greater part of the civilized world. The lesser religions and beliefs are nearly always branches. There are further divisions within these groups themselves, or divisions caused by the commixture of two or more groups, usually in, in uh, what you might term border culture zones, where peoples have been exposed to two or more religions with relatively equal influence. These uh, culture zones may therefore produce compounding faiths, or religions built up of more than one element. But we have five that are very powerful and that constitute the greater part of our religious life. One of these is Hinduism, another Buddhism, a third the religions and philosophies of China, the fourth Muslimism, and the fifth Judeo-Christianity. These constitute the great religious structures of our world. And in some mysterious way, they seem to fulfill uh, the old pattern. For into these, to make them possible, has flowed a tremendous amount of ancient tradition. They are the living witnesses to all that has gone before. Now, some religions are a little ashamed of their own inheritance. Uh, they seem to feel that their importance lies upon their isolation, that they must try to kill out or conceal the fact that they have a common spiritual indebtedness. To my mind, this has always been a mistake, because it seems it's a deliberate effort at isolation. And in so doing, the individual, by separating himself voluntarily from the great pattern, closes his eyes and his consciousness to the wholeness of things and must therefore uh, be penalized by having a fragmentary spiritual existence. This arises from all vestiges of intolerance and from all comparison and from this great problem so expressed by the story of the Pharisees uh, in which uh, the individual says, I am holier than thou. Actually, all of these faiths are to a measure mutually interdependent that they have tremendous inter-spiritual integrities. They have all communicated and transmitted vastly vital messages, and they continue to lead and to guard the peoples of the world. This leaves us two divisions which have not yet been clarified. And I think that this clarification lies very largely in the growth or unfoldment of the future state of man. Every great religion in the world has in some degree or in some way anticipated a future dispensation yet to come, a way of life not yet perfect, which is to be fulfilled by some kind either of an avatar or of an embodiment of a superior being, or by means of an achievement by man himself, which becomes 
equivalent to his awakening or his salvation through the increased spiritual availability of truth to himself. Thus the, the uh, sixth and seventh religions have not yet been fashioned because man himself has not yet perfected them. There is a feeling that uh, many have, and perhaps it is not an unwise feeling, that future religious differentiation within this great racial cycle is in some way dependent upon the rise of the newest instrument which we have in knowledge, namely science. That uh, although today perhaps religion and science are a little better than incompatible in practice, that religion in the future is most likely to arise from the scientific level. Something is happening and will continue to happen. The toga or the torch which must be passed on is gradually going to be moved into the keeping of a new dimension of consciousness arising from scientific penetration of the unknown. Today we have no very clear vestige of what this is going to be, except perhaps that we know that if man seeks long enough and far enough in any direction, he is going to find only one thing, and that is the mystery of reality. If he continues doggedly in his pursuit of the unknown, he must ultimately attain that which may be known. And whichever way he turns, however he may seek, he will always come in the end to the final thing, and that is the realization of universal consciousness. There is nothing else that can solve any problem. So it's quite possible that in the centuries that lie ahead, what we call science will gradually be metamorphosed into a great religious revelation. And that when this occurs, in the fullness of time, the struggle between faith and knowledge will no longer continue. The seventh division of the religious life of a people, the seventh religion, must then naturally arise from that which precedes it. And in this case, as always, the seventh must be the, the fulfillment of the first, where the that which is in the beginning shall be in the end. The first shall be last, says the scripture, and this particularly relates to the mystery of spiritual understanding. The religion which began, which died by being submerged into the mystery of creeds, is the great unity which must ultimately emerge. So as unity leads first to diversity, and then diversity ultimately leads back to unity, so the seventh religion of a cycle is the gradual restatement of the total picture. In the beginning there is one, and in the end there is an all that becomes one. So those who are laboring toward this great religious inter-understanding are definitely laboring toward the future. They are what the medieval mystics call the sons of towardness. They are laboring to the fulfillment of an instinct, namely this instinct that all religion is one great experience and that until we appreciate it as such, we can never fully understand it. And where a beautiful idea has fallen upon evil times and has been used at the expense and to the expense of a great many sincere persons. Yet there are facts relating to these things which must or should be known. And therefore, we can only remind the uh, individual, the truth seeker, of the importance of his own integrity in the estimation of these values. In other words, the moment we come into the problem of the mystery schools and the descent of the great initiate tradition, we face people with an unknown, something that cannot be immediately checked, something that must be accepted or rejected upon authority of some kind, and which is outside of the probable experience of the individual believing it. 
Therefore, we rather advise the Socratic approach to this problem, namely that we are not always impelled irresistibly to experiment with everything we hear about. It should be possible for us to appreciate certain concepts without attempting to force situations in our own lives. We should consider these things as forms of knowledge and not as something upon which we are going to build some private psychosis that may become dangerous and confusing to us. But this we do know, and it is now one of those secrets that has long been exposed and therefore can never be put back again into the listing or classification of secrecy. And having once become the available to man, there is only one thing he can do with it. He must learn how to handle it. The tradition of the great schools cannot be taken away from them, from us. We know it. Therefore, as we can no longer be ignorant of it, we must begin to prepare to handle this form of knowledge, handling it discreetly, honorably, thoughtfully, wisely, and not become confused or not develop delusions of grandeur uh, over these types of thinking. Thus we have this point. Everywhere in the world, from Asia to the ancient Americas, every religion and faith has affirmed and insisted <coughs> that there exists in the world certain individuals who have become competitive masters of the art of living. I think we may assume without doubt or question that the schools also gave us the natural admonitions in regard to these people. Maya, in his study of the laws of the Rosy Cross, published in the middle of the 17th century, points out that the mysterious brethren of this order are bound by an obligation, or by a series of obligations, by which they shall remain unknown, that they shall dress only in the garments of the countries in which they live, shall in so far as possible speak only the language of the country in which they live, that under no condition for any reason are they to seem different or nor are they to affirm the possession of any unusual or extraordinary knowledge, nor are they under any condition to admit to others other than of their own order the societies to which they belong or the degrees of attainment which they have reached. Any individual telling anyone else any such information, publicizing it, announcing it, or advertising it, is breaking the basic rules of the order. This, I think, is an old document, but rather well worth remembering. Namely, that insofar as these brethren are concerned, uh, like all of their kind, uh, they are bound by certain obligations of discretion. And anyone not so operating or so expressing himself should be subject to the gravest uh, suspicion. In any event, that such persons have existed for a long time and for ages, we find, because we have references to them in the Bible, in the ancient Egyptian and Indic writings, in China, in Greece, in Egypt, and even again in Western Europe and America. During the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, there was a great revival of the mysteries of chemistry under the term alchemistical speculations. And at this time, the mystic chemists divided themselves into three levels or orders. The lowest of these orders they called the illuminates. The second order they called the initiates. And the highest and third order they called the adepts. Our term, term adept, as we generally use it in the West, is derived, therefore, principally from the alchemical tradition. And over the alchemical adepts ruled the mysterious and intangible being Elias Artista, Elias the artist, the mysterious master of the secret of the transmutation of metals. Uh, this mysterious Elias occur, appeared on a number of occasions, is recorded in certain alchemical texts, 
Discussions and descriptions of him are also to be found, but he is the most elusive personality in the entire history of Western esotericism. Elias the artist, the adept of the metals, has his parallel in Eastern religions, in the secret schools of Islam, particularly the dervishes, where we find numerous references to the adepts, particularly the green-robed masters who uh, are mentioned in that most recondite and delightful work, The Arabian Nights Entertainment. They are also mentioned in the great Muslim religious classic, The Book of the Adepts, which deals entirely with the descent of these great illumined saints, these mysterious and invisible powers available only to those whom they may select. We find similar discussions and similar symbolisms throughout India with its strange and elusive doctrine of Mahatmas and Rishis. We find the same in the Arhats of Buddhism, also in the mysterious mystics of Tibet. The same doctrine appears in China in the ancient ones who are called the mountain people. Their symbol is, the, uh, is a compound of two, of two Chinese glyphs, one representing mountain and the other representing man. These are the mountain people, the ones who have retired from the world to live in the mountain of the wise, and they also are engaged in alchemical experiments and in the practice of yogic and tantric disciplines. Now these strange and mysterious people we find them among the Eskimos, among the shamans of Mongolia. We find them down in the South Sea Islands, among the various tribes of Africa. Wherever man has gradually integrated a concept of religion, he has also integrated a, a recognition of the mysterious ones, the olds and the trues of American Indian lore and mysticism. The mysterious gods, the Manados, who walk with men. Always there has been the supernatural visitor, the being who is different, but who may come and spend a day under our roof and go on again, and we shall never hear of him any more. The wandering ones who come to answer prayer, or who come uh, to perform certain rites. Uh, down, for instance, in New Mexico, there is a little church. And in this church there is a curious staircase, which perhaps is one of the most remarkable bits of uh, carpentry that has ever been my privilege to see. In this little church there was no room for a congregation, and at the same time a flight of stairs leading into the choir loft. If they had had the stairs in, there was no room for the people. The church was so small. So the church prayed that there might be some way to get into the choir loft without removing the congregation. And one day a man with a box of tools came along dressed in a white coat and trousers and he said, I believe you folks need a staircase. And they said, yes, we certainly do, but how did you know? And he says, I just find out about these things. So he built a staircase that is a perfect spiral without support. Every part of it linked together without even so much as a nail. And this staircase twists in a perfect circle up into the choir loft and has no supports for any part of the spiral. Yet it is perfectly secure and perfectly good. And uh, when they asked him what they owed him for the staircase, he said nothing. And when he left, he left a little note behind him. He said, with the compliments of Joseph the carpenter. And no one ever found out who he was, where he came from, and no one else ever saw him again. Well, if that had happened 300 years ago in Europe, it would have been regarded as probable if one of these strange wandering persons who knew so much and whom no one knew was responsible for a thing like that. Even today, we haven't got a right, good, offhand explanation, but we don't approach it in quite that way. Well, <laughs> any, in any event, religion is always rich with these stories. Stories which uh, affect persons uh, many times so essentially reputable and so distinctively uh, realistic that it is hard for us to completely ignore them.
a story such as that of the Count St. Germain and his place in European life and thought, and of numerous arhats and religious leaders of Asia. These beings we cannot completely deny. I remember talking with a very venerable old Indian mystic in uh, Calcutta, and he said, you know, ever since the British have been here, they have been trying to tell us there were no such things as Mahatmas. And all we can do is smile and say, someday there will be no such things as British. <laughs> in other words, the fact remains that these things have never been shifted by education or culture as we know it. Because these experiences come too close to the personal life of the individual. And in the old teaching, the belief was that what we call the spiritual government of the world was entrusted to a, a, an order of human beings rooted in a divine pattern and led by powers superior to man, functioning through mortal beings, and that this government actually held the entire earth in a spiritual equilibrium. That this government consisted essentially and basically of a complete astronomical theory that the great government of the world or of the adepts, the mystery schools, is according to universal existence itself. This government was said originally to be the source of the idea of the twelve mysterious powers that sit together around the mysterious siege perilous, around the holy table, that this group of twelve represents the zodiac, and that in actual factual consideration, uh, these twelve powers, these twelve supreme leaders, out of the great evolutionary process of the race, represent the twelve highest embodiments known to man of the twelve great celestial orders. In other words, they represent those beings who have specialized to the most complete degree the powers represented in the vast uh, zodiacal band. Because the zodiac is not merely a band of constellations or of plus stars or suns. It is a band of powers. And every power there present exists somewhere in the life of man himself. And we are the unfolding of the band of the holy animals from the word zodiac, which in turn is from zoon, meaning the animal. This band, then, it speaks to us of what we might term exceptional attainment. We all recognize the genius and abilities of certain persons. We recognize with great admiration the genius of Leonardo da Vinci, a man who is said to have mastered between 70 and 80 arts and sciences. We recognize with profound admiration the musical genius of a man like Ignace Paderewski. We also admire the technical mind of an Einstein. We admire the delicate painting of a Raphael. And we know that perhaps there is truth in the words that Stradivarius said when asked, how he made his violins and why. He said God made Antonio to make violins and there was just nothing more you could say about it. But we know that in every field of endeavor there is excellence. Then we know that below that there are relative degrees of excellence, perfection, and imperfection. There will be always some singers who have fair voices, others who have good voices, a few who have fine voices, but only a very few who have great voices. And that these great voices are a combination of gift and effort. That the gift in all probability corresponds to evolutionary bestowal out of the past. And effort is the skill, the wisdom, and the courage to develop that which already is. But these persons who have excelled greatly, we honor. And we honor them in every field in which that excellence is visible to us. 
Is it therefore unreasonable to assume that there may be excellences in fields not readily visible to us? After all, the greatest art in all the world is the art of perfecting the internal resources and potentials of the self. The greatest of all sciences is the science of the service of mankind, that is, a service based upon total enlightenment. As there are persons in many degrees of understanding, there must be some who are of understanding beyond our own. Just as there must be people who can write on a typewriter faster than we can, or who can paint a better picture than we can. The individual, therefore, who constitutes the adept idea, or whom we associate it with it, is the individual who has made the greatest attainment out of past living and present achievement of the absolute art of universal existence. The art or science of the revelation through the individual of as much of the total potential as he can possibly release. This is the Muslim approach to the problem. For to them, these mysterious adepts are actually only our brethren who have become perfect in essential things, while we have been content to be perfect in non-essential things. We have been willing to believe that if we could fly higher into the stratosphere than anyone else, it was an accomplishment. They take the attitude that the individual who attains or achieves the greatest degree of internal integration is the person who has made the greatest accomplishment. Unfortunately, those less integrated can hardly recognize such an achievement, but we can always recognize, at least for the sound, when a uh, plane goes through the sound barrier. <laughs> this is a spectacular achievement, but we are not trained to recognize the most spectacular thing of all, and that is the individual who stands as an example of the greatest unfoldment of the life, power, and consciousness potential in man. So the adept becomes the symbol of simply one who knows more about the mystery of life itself, who has therefore become an expert, who is therefore a master of the keys of transmutation and regeneration. The individual who is the elder brother, the natural leader, the teacher, the guardian, and the guide of those less informed than himself. And because his, his state of being informed is genuine, and he is not merely an intellectual, and because his growth has depended upon a magnificent clarification of values, we know that the adept initiate teacher is always dedicated to those things which are real and beyond the power of flattery or ulterior motive as we know them. So all over the world we have recognized the existence of these beings, <laughs> and we have said that they live upon or in the suburbs of heaven and are the messengers of the generalissimo of the world that they are therefore the servants of the great king those who ride forth upon their swift steeds carrying the banners of Shambhala they are the keepers of the battlements of light and while we may or may not ever see them know them or recognize them the whole world in its deepest religious conviction believes them to exist and is able to advance a kind of proving, a form of evidence that is acceptable to those who are willing to consider it, namely that the individual who wishes to prove this for himself must become capable in himself of recognizing this degree of advancement when he beholds it. And until he himself knows it, he will never know whether anyone else possesses it or not. Up to that time, he must only accept or reject upon the basis of his own intellectual attainments. So the adept tradition being universally distributed, we can then follow the general thinking that associates with it. In the great school, according to the old teaching, the twelve who form the great hierarchy, or the twelve orders that are the human equivalent of the twelve hierarchies of heaven recognized in the ancient classical and Kabbalistic mysteries that these surround the mysterious throne of power the mysterious siege perilous that is ever vacant the uh, symbol of the Sidi Vecanti the chair that is empty the throne that no one can occupy 
And this throne is the symbol of the great power of the Logos, or the divine being itself, which if present remains unseen, and can be known only by the benediction which it bestows. This is therefore the first church, the original ecclesia, where those who are gathered together receive the mysterious Pentecostal experience, or the descent of the Holy Spirit, and where these symbols occur in other religions, and they occur in most other religions, they are all said to be derived from the basic symbolism of this essential world mystery. In this great system it is announced or told that in the remoteness of time five brethren of this great order went forth into the world to produce certain distinct and uh, useful effects in those days when the world was in the forming. That these five are corresponding to the first five signs of the zodiac. And that these five, having completed the mystery or the ministry for which they were intended, retire from the world and never leave this great siege perilous. They are the five guardians of the throne. They remain forever in the holy house of the mysteries. This remain, allows the seven remaining to, to have a kind of manifestation of their own. And these other seven, representing the other seven signs of the zodiac, form the mysterious jewel of seven stars, referred to in ancient Egyptian mysteries, and the secret mystery of the little bear, or the symbol of the rishis of India. The seven who become the, spa, the star ones, uh, the great light ones, the blazing, the, the shining, from which our word rishi would come. These are the seven mysterious internal planets, or symbols of the seven powers of the soul, over which these beings have attained their peculiar uh, virtue or uh, achievement. These, in turn, become part of an order of manifestation in which already five of these mysterious beings or powers have formed their schools or have sent forth from themselves their orders and their hierarchs of teachers. The other two await, like the sixth, sixth and seventh Buddha, for the time uh, which shall be with us in the great day. In other words, in the time which is next, or in the time which shall come in the fullness of things. Each of these schools, the five that have come forth into manifestation, and are Dhyana Buddhas, each of these five immediately surrounds itself with an order of twelve. Each of these in turn is divided into five who remain with the teacher and seven who go out. And of each of those sevens, two have not gone out. In turn, this cycle surrounds itself again, each of these with twelve, and each of those in turn with twelve until the order descends twelve times. And the mysterious formula of the hundred and forty-four thousand of the redeemed is the mathematical formula of twelve, twelve times. And as you go into it, you realize that just as uh, the number uh, three plus three is also symbolically either six or three three or thirty-three, so you're at 12, 12 as the same method of projection symbolically. In any way we wish to look at it, these also constitute the mystery of the redeemed, the mysterious power of the ones who are saved, and the 72 of a school are taken as the elders who are selected from the tribes of Israel. It, uh, in the tabernacle mysteries, the entire formula is repeated on another level. Wherever the number 72 appears, it has to do again with these hierarchies. In the practical consideration of it then, we have moving downward from the upper or inner spiritual life of man a religious revelation of truth administered by a descending hierarchy composed 
of adepts, initiates, illumines, and disciples. The adepts, initiates, and illumines, as they are called, represent the three higher orders of the mystery. And below them are the nine levels composed of disciples, which ascend through nine levels, representing the nine months of generation and corresponding with the nine degrees of the Eleusinian mysteries. By these nine mysteries, man recapitulates the mystery of his own generation. Man is a perfect twelve, or the circle of the zodiac, which he achieves by nine months in the womb and three degrees in the mysteries. And when this has been completed, he is then perfect, upright, and true. So in the ancient rituals, we have several divisions. One division by seven, another division by nine, another division by three, and a division by five. We have three, five, seven, nine. All of these numbers relating uh, to the esoteric schools and their structures in a certain order. After the thought has come to our attention and uh, we consider it <coughs> with some uh, reality of reflection, we therefore see that the ancient law which we referred to in connection with the planets again reasserts itself. The hierarchs represent a descending power moving through their initiate teachers. Humanity growing upward is represented by the chelas and disciples who ascend step by step under their gurus and teachers until we begin to understand why the gurus were called in India in old time the gates. Each of the teachers is a gate leading through himself to something that is beyond himself and fortunate is that teacher whose disciple excels him. That is something that is again hard for us to think in the Western world where it is very important for the competition of excellence that somebody excels somebody but that no one shall excel us. The, uh, the, the purpose of the entire school is that the individual shall always excel the teacher, a point which Socrates so clearly reveal, reveals to us. So we have a group of disciples ascending. We have the great structure of the school unfolding. And little by little we find the purpose of it revealed to us. In the ancient mysteries, we are told that the school originally, the great school originally, consisted entirely of superhuman beings, beings who were not productions of our earth humanity at all, that they represented ambassadors or ministers extraordinary from other spheres, other levels, other planes, drawn here to form the great guardianship over humanity during the primordial period, and that these powers therefore exercised a kind of autocratic rulership. From them has descended the legends of the jealous gods, the gods who punished terribly those who broke their laws in any way, and demanded total obedience and allegiance from their peoples. Because in these days the struggle for survival was very different from what it is now and human beings were not as highly evolved, nor were they capable of individual initiative of a constructive nature. But gradually, through the last several million years, from the fourth subdivision of the great Atlantean era, the ADEPT school has gradually shifted. By degrees, each of the various levels of authority are taken over by the unfolding students of our own humanity. Each time a human being attains a certain degree of unfoldment, the symbolism tells us a god is liberated to return to his star. Each time man becomes self-controlling, self-administering, the universe retires a little bit into the subjective and lets him take over for the reason that in the end man must become totally self-governing and the invisible government of the world that has functioned through the adept tradition must gradually become visible 
take, be taken over by humanity itself and become the ultimate perfect working formula for man's administration of his own world. Thus the great kingdoms, empires, principalities, and powers of the earth are subjectively or symbolically always in some ratio to the great world government. They may be deformed, they may be exploited, they may be perverted, but the principles beneath them are identical with the principle of the great world government. Now in various parts of the world this government has uh, more or less appeared in symbolism. But perhaps in no place has it appeared so obviously or with such um, available pattern as it has in the great order of the garter in England. The chapel of St. George of the Garter tells us uh, perhaps more clearly than any other human institution the entire concept. Uh, obviously it has departed from its original footing, footings but much of the symbolism remains. The chapel of St. George of the Garter is the chapel of the kings at Windsor. It is here that in the ancient time the knights of the Garter met and even under comparatively recent times. And, and in the height of its authority, every throne of the great church or chapel of the garter was occupied by either the actual head of a government or some very highly influential person in that government. And in the chapel of St. George, for instance, are the thrones of the garter kings and on these thrones are the names and tablets of those who have occupied them. And, and over each throne is the banner representing this government. And perhaps it would be a little surprising to realize that one throne was occupied by the Emperor of Japan, another by the Emperor of China at the time they had an emperor, and alongside of that the throne of the Emperor of Germany. All of the royal powers of Europe seated together in the chapel of the garter and with them many of the great powers of Asia. Here was a symbolic statement. Now at a certain time in their rituals the knights with their squires and pages because your squire becomes your initiate, your page becomes your illuminate. Each initiate with his two uh, attendants, his squire and his page, taken from the orders of chivalry which were also, like the great paladins of Charlemagne, a restatement of the great cycle. At a certain time the knights drew their swords, each one with the cross of cruciform handle, and they formed by the interlacing of their blades a great star of light in the center of the chapel. And their blades formed a point, a star of many points with an open center. And this was the symbol of the siege perilous or the moment, or the great symbol of the coming of the star of light, or the presence of the Adept King, who was never visible, but was regarded as being in the midst of them at all times. So here was an, a kind of government of the world. It was symbolical, certainly, particularly after the loss of the Black Book, which was said to have been the book of the mystery of kings, originally given to the world by Hermes Trismegistus. All this symbolism, however, like the symbolism of the meeting of the knights in Parsifal and the great castle of the Grail. The castle of the Grail is the symbol of the great white lodge. Each of these groups are the same essential symbolism. They tell us of two things. First, of a divine government moving out constantly. And the second, of an ascending humanity climbing the rungs of a ladder and gradually taking upon itself the responsibilities of self-government before men. Thus as material mankind works for the establishment of self-government through democracy, so the internal life of man spiritually is being directed inevitably toward ultimate uh, self-government through illumination. Thus the entire school, the hierarchy, is built upon this double interlacing pattern the pattern of man growing upward and gradually taking upon himself the responsibilities for his own conduct man coming of age finally becomes the total governor of his world 
Now, in the course of ages, according to the esoteric tradition, there comes periodic intervals, breaks in the normal growth of things, uh, periods in which transitions from one level of growth to another become imperative. And these transitions are related to what is called the cycle of the phoenix. And the cycle of the phoenix was the old method used to measure the repetition of the bird of immortality, the rebirths of the adept king concept. The phoenix is always the symbol of the world teacher. It is also the symbol of the work of the world, for it is the labor of the world teacher uh, that man shall rise from the ashes of his own dead, and that from the death of things birth shall come. For the phoenix is one bird alone in the world without a mate. And this bird, when it comes to die, flies to an altar in Ethiopia, and there perishes of its own will by casting itself into the flames. And at the time of this occurrence, the body of the dead bird breaks open, and from its charred ruins the phoenix is reborn. The new phoenix is born from the body of the old. This probably is why it was chosen anciently as the symbol of the seal of the adept king, and why perhaps it was chosen originally to be placed upon the obverse of the great seal of the United States which uh, bird has gradually lost a little of its phoenix-like attribute and is now regarded as an eagle. But in the original seal, on the original dollars, and in the original engraving, it is a phoenix. This uh, phoenix of immortality is said to live 600 years. Therefore, in the ancient mysteries and traditions, it is said that certain dates, 1200 B.C., 600 B.C., the beginning of the Christian era, 600 A.D., 1200 A.D., 1800 A.D., 2400 A.D., that these are called the cycle dates of the phoenix. And it is assumed that wherever these dates arise, either visibly to man or invisibly in the hierarchy, uh, the great steps of the rebirth of the wisdom religion must take place. And we know, for example, that the cycle of the phoenix is quite traceable at least uh, through three of the cycles, although we are not aware of the workings of all of them. The 6th century B.C. was one of the great centuries in the history of the world. For in that century, Pythagoras, Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tse, were all, and Zoroaster, Spitama, were all alive at the same time. We know that... 600 years later was the beginning of the Christian era. 600 years after that, the rise of Islamism. These changes took place. We go on a little further, we begin to see the possibilities that we may have to shift our perspective to other parts of the world to find the cycle of the Phoenix. But 1200 B.C. corresponds very closely with the great reformation of religion in Egypt and the rise of Judaism. And uh, 1200 A.D., corresponds very closely with the great political changes rising from the rise of the Mongols in Asia and the forces that ultimately brought about the discovery of the Western Hemisphere. All of these different situations are supposedly related to the Phoenix cycle. Now in Asia, the cycle of the adepts is not as deeply concealed as it is in the West. And particularly in Tibet, Bhutan, and in those areas, Nepal, it comes very close to the surface of the public mind. And for that reason, uh, we have legends and myths in greater number relating to this problem than perhaps anywhere else. The Tibetans expect, or and still do expect, although they're under some adversity at the moment. I think their proprietors are under greater adversity, however. <laughs> There's nothing more difficult to get along with than an unwilling ally. <laughs> but the Tibetans are convinced that before the end of the present century uh, that the banners of Shambhala will be unfurled 
and that another messenger on the white horse will ride upon the wind. They believe this firmly. Now the cycles by which they measure do not imply that this will be a great avatar, but they imply that it will be a representative of the hierarchy. They also uh, believe that the hierarchy will continue to operate uh, through its selected schools of disciples and will press forward outwardly into some manifestation, not as an order, but as a series of conditions set up in society for the attainment of certain ends. The mystery schools affirm that their servants were not always known even to the servant himself that the school operated in three ways upon society. First, by sending a messenger. Secondly, by selecting someone in society and entrusting them with the message. And third, simply using, without conscious knowledge, a selected person in a critical situation and bringing the knowledge through to him by an instinctive or intuitive pressure which he himself did not know. Therefore, the uh, concept in Tibet has been for some time that the avatar that is to come is not going to be a person moving upon the surface of things, but the continual flowing of internals. And that the great Maitreya, the Lord who is to come, the next great Buddha of the Asiatic Northern system, is not going to appear as a teacher for the reason that we can no longer function in this way, but that the uh, Maitreya comes through a pressure exerted upon the psychic life of the, of the world, namely that it will come through the increasing soul vehicle of mankind. Through evolution, through growth, and through dedication, Humanity is growing and is developing. We don't realize this sometimes when we look around us and it looks pretty dismal. But actually, when studied from the standpoint of the invisible life of things, the world is better than it has ever been. It is better because more people are dreaming a little nearer to the truth. More human beings are hoping, creating, feeling than ever before. And while a few dynamic and difficult problems face us, the whole soul of the race is richer than it has ever been. And as this soul power of the race itself grows, it becomes available. It becomes the living Merkava, or the chariot of the Archangel Michael. It becomes a wheel truly filled with eyes upon which rides the king of the world. Therefore, actually, this psychic field, uh, which is available to all men, and which sustains the psychic life of the world, constitutes an ever more available field for the dissemination of psychic patterns. And according to the Eastern belief, the next great teacher simply bursts through mankind that all over the world, human beings in every walk of life will feel a kind of growth. They will attribute it to their own faiths. They will never suspect anything in particular except that it will become vitally easier to do the things that are next. And instinctively they will be done. The individual will feel more and more the call of enlightenment. And through this will come the changes which we hope for. One will be attributed to one person. One will be attributed to a new law. Someone else will say, and somehow we were lucky enough to get a better administration this time. No one will know what it is. But when the hour comes, when the great Lord of Shambhala places his feet upon the earth, things will move from within themselves, not to some idyllic perfection, but to the next great thing that must be done. Now the next thing certainly that has to be done is to fulfill the purpose of the fifth sub-race to which we belong. 
and the fulfillment of this purpose and the consummation of it so that the next great racial motion can begin within it is that we have to solve the great problem of the Arius. We have to come a little closer to the purpose for which we were created. And that is, in our case, the rescuing of the mind from the obvious. We have got to begin to recognize the creative dimensions of the mind. And gradually, the science of conscious adjustment to value must be intensified. Man must develop the bridge between objectivity and subjectivity, because if he does not, he is locked in the objective and the obvious for all time. So to build this bridge, we must fulfill the admonition of our remote ancestors, man know thyself. So the next great move, according to the tradition, <coughs> is that man will begin to experience the unfoldment of internal faculties of apperception. That things that to us are now strange and mysterious will be of increasing frequency as the psychic field of man releases them. And that the time will come not too far in the distance when we shall begin to live with roots in conviction and the ability to internally experience the fact of an internal life. That we shall consciously recognize our own dignity as beings. And that out of that dignity recognition, out of this valuation of things, must come a total reorganization of civilization. For this reorganization can only come from the individual who is no longer able to accept the thing as it is now. And the only thing that can change him is the increasing dimension of his own consciousness. Therefore, the next sensory perception must come. And with each sensory perception, the total slate of man is changed. Everything that was is no longer enough. Therefore, man, using the faculties that he possesses, must live according to them. And as these faculties give him greater depth penetration, he must live according to this penetration. He can live no other way. So the great school, advancing its purposes, takes things that were once hidden, except from the few, and tells us that the visions of the prophets, the mysterious reveries of the saints and the great mystical experiences of the avatars, that all these things are the heraldings of powers ultimately available to all men. And that every human being has within himself the necessary potential by which he can come to the living experience of his own spiritual fact his own need, his own universal reality. As each level of this is achieved, the adept king, the symbol of the divine intercession, the adept king is able to retire one of his ministers from the objective to the subjective, releasing these powers that took the oath of servitude. For there is a legend uh, that these great powers took upon themselves voluntarily the burden of leading the spiritual life of the race, affirming that they would not depart or, or in any way cease their labors until the human being could support himself, that he could carry on in his own way, so that uh, gradually the intercession of divine powers is removed as man gains his own ability to rule his, his world and himself. But the power by which he does it is the divine power in him. It is therefore his direct availability that makes intercession no longer necessary. And this uh, concept is leading toward the ultimate state of the great Vedic revelation, the great faith of the race the great face of the faith of the Aryas is that the law, the tremendous revelation 
that was given to the race a million years ago in the great mysteries of the trans Himalayas, that this revelation would ultimately bring man to his own emancipation. Know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that freedom in this sense means self-responsibility as contrasted to guidance by paternal or patriarchal orders. So that man finally coming into the fullness of his religion brings it from heaven to earth, brings it from the invisible to the visible, and establishes here the great empire according to the law. When the human being has achieved his full understanding of the cosmic procedure, he will create a material way of government, of administration, of life, of education, of culture, and of growth, which is patterned exactly from the celestial law, so that ultimately the laws of heaven shall be made manifest upon the earth. And when man understands the internal universe, he will run the external universe according to its rules. And in so doing, he will create the empire that shall endure. He will create the way of life that cannot die, because it is a manifestation of an eternal life itself. As he corrects these various errors, he will perfect his own systems. And so finally, he will, be, he will have available to him the direct stream of his own religion. He will bring it to maturity. And in its maturity, it will become the great leader of his life. When that has been accomplished, the invisible temple will be visible in the world. The religions will become the servants of religion itself. And all the faiths of men will recognize their servitude to the eternal faith itself. And in this time, we will have reconciliation, not because men are tolerant, but because truth itself is one. And when this is internally experienced, patience is no longer necessary in confusion. So ultimately, in the seventh division, the one law must be brought together. Science, religion, philosophy must be reunited. And religion must find that its seven rays or its seven parts are merely the prismatic appearances of its one light. Man, having experienced these things, will understand the great mystery of faith as an experience within himself. He will then discover that whether he knew it or not, that each human being belongs to one of the seven colors, that he is part of these colors of good and evil, that each human soul, in the beginning of its great pilgrimage, came forth from one of the seven rays, and that therefore he returns home along his ray, and that therefore he has a specialized existence, but that this existence, though specialized, is compatible with all other existence, and that any seven persons uniting, one belonging to each ray, forms the perfect jewel, and that these rays are not combative or competitive, but represent the seven powers of God, in turn the projections of the seven laws of nature, in turn the mastery of the seven arts and sciences, and still further extension, uh, the consciousness of the seven mysteries of religion. Thus the human being, finding his own road and his own path, finds that it leads to the total unity, where each individual will ultimately return to his home, to his place in universal consciousness, along the rays from which he came forth in the beginning. These rays are the guardian angels of religious philosophy. And having returned home, he finds again that he is united with all things. So along the seven paths, he returns to the great house. And there he is joined by the five who never come forth. And together they celebrate the mysterious cosmic Eucharist, the symbol of the participation in the total life of the world. All these mysteries belong essentially to the secret school tradition. Fragments have come out in all religions, but the total concept awaits its perfect fulfillment in the spiritual experience of man himself. Well, I guess our time is up, so that's the best we can do for this time. And we hope to see you next week.